All right, guys, welcome back. And as you know, we always do a podcast review of the week, except for when we don't. So this is one of those weeks where we don't. Uh, often, I don't give out the email address. I just forget. I don't really pay too much attention to it. So if you guys have any comments or want to shoot something in, you guys know I'm on social media. I'm very easy to find on Facebook. Um, however, if you want to email for some reason, a couple guys have shot me emails over the years. Uh, so it's the Christian dad podcast at gmail.com. And it's been pretty cool. We've been in a season where we have had a small group called the ascent. Uh, it's a group of less than 12 guys that are focused on whatever it is. That's going to bring us towards our three to five year goals that it's going to bring us towards our vision. We're very intentional. We've got 12 week goals that we're, we're moving towards. We measure what we do daily. We measure our week. And we adapt and change and challenge each other, hold each other accountable. So it's been really, really cool. Got some great guys from this community. Some of the guys that have been on the podcast before, and we've got some guys that are going through some stuff that uh, could use some help. And at the same time, they've been an inspiration to guys that are in a good season of life right now. that are moving towards some big goals, publishing books, getting some podcasts out there, putting their own coaching together. But Whatever season of life you're in, it's awesome to have goals and have people around you moving you towards those goals. So if you don't have a group around you that's helping move you, whether it be just one guy or whether it be a group of guys, I highly, highly encourage you to seek a group out and develop some relationships with other guys that'll challenge you and help you move towards where you want to go. Otherwise, you'll be in just the day-to-day -day routine of life. You'll be moving along. You'll be in that path and wherever the road takes, wherever the road goes, that's where you'll go. And it doesn't really matter if you don't have a destination you want to go to. It doesn't really matter what road you take. All of them is going to get you wherever <laughs> they're going to take you somewhere. Might not be where you want to go. So I encourage you guys to be intentional and get some guys around you. So if you're looking for something, uh, join us in the Facebook page, the Join of a Christian Journey of a Christian Dad Facebook page. There are a bunch of guys uh, in that group that'll contribute, help you out. Feel free to throw your stuff in there. And then uh, we do have some small group stuff that we do inside the community as well. Um, and as always, throw your reviews of the week in there and I'll read them on an upcoming show. So enough about that. Enough about that. Let's jump right in. It's so cool. We've got a a musician on the show. I'm trying to think if we've ever had somebody that's like professionally a musician. So this is cool. I think you were the very first one. So today we've got nice. Shellum Klein on with us. Welcome, Shellum. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Yes, sir. And and, and you're also definitely the first Shellum that's ever been on the show. You know what? I get that a lot. Uh, <laughs> I get that. We've, we've actually got this running joke that if I ever run for president, I've already got my campaign slogan, vote for Shellum, he will tell them. So that's kind of how everybody's working it. So yeah, I have to explain, I have to explain that to people because they, most people can't say my name. <laughs> Is that Irish or Scottish or? Um, in all honesty, um, it, I think it's German. German, you know? okay. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. I know my dad's middle name was Shellum and my dad's dad, my grandfather's middle name was Shellum. And he was named after the doctor that delivered him, whose last name was Shellum. So huh. technically, I was supposed to be a Brian, but because that's what my dad wanted. But after my mom had me, she sent him to go get food from McDonald's. And while he was gone, she named me Shellum. So that way he didn't have a say so when he got back. So, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how that worked. Y'all country so, folks do things funny. Uh, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. For sure. For sure. But it's funny because uh, I've been told a lot that it's a great marketing name because nobody else has it. You know, it works. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Absolutely not. And uh, German, Klein, means small. Right. So maybe I'm small. I don't know. Even though I'm <laughs> I don't know. We'll go with that, right? <laughs> so, so your dad was a musician also. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing uh, and stuff. Okay. Well, my, my grandfather was. Grandfather's grandfather, musician. Yes, there we my go. grandfather was. Um, I actually started out in the gospel music world, obviously, um, singing in and around our home state of North Carolina, doing maybe 20, 25 churches a year um, with the Gilbert family was the name of it. Um, it was my grandfather, my grandmother, my mom, and myself. And uh, my grandfather was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, so they came off the road. And I was about, mm, about 16, 17 at that time. And uh, I was like, no, I'm, I still want to sing. And so I pursued my 
uh, musical career and uh, just kind of did the whole little part-time type thing. But at the uh, end of it all, I've been full-time six years now, um, actually have signed a, a major record deal um, in Nashville and uh, on a publishing uh, contract as well, um, where I'm writing for a lot of today's artists, both in the Christian music world and the country music world. And uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting how all this is working and how God is just allowing me to share my story with folks that's going through the exact same thing that I have fight, or that I've had to fight and uh, just be an encouragement um, to, to other folks all across the country and even the world. Oh, that's fantastic. So we had a guy on uh, Brian Veneri. Man, I feel so good pronouncing his last name right again for the <laughs> second time in a row. So um, he was talking about Strength Finder. Right. And I was, I was out today this morning doing a, a rucking event where we throw a bunch of weight in a backpack and walk okay. for a pretty long ways. And one of the guys is like, oh, yeah, Strength Finder. You got it. Like he brought it up himself. So I'm like, it's funny. I have a conversation yesterday. And then right. the very next day, another guy's bringing up the same type thing. So you getting into music, uh, I assume that you've got like just a God-given talent. I try. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I, I can pick things out like on the piano or, or the guitar, uh, mostly the piano when I'm writing. But it's, it's weird because I just I sit down and writing is what I love. And, and then singing, um, you will not see when I'm performing. I, I do not play guitar. I don't play piano at the, at the performances. For two reasons. A, I got to be walking around and, you know, I just, I can't do two things at once. It just doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> um, but second of all, I, I feel like there's a barrier there, if you see what I'm saying. And yeah, yeah. Uh, that's kind of what, one of the issues that, uh, that we've actually had. And I'm like, you know, I, when I'm out there, I'm going to be, I've got the microphone in my hand. I'm going to be, you know, working with it and uh, wanting, wanting to not have a barrier in between the audience and myself. Yes. So, I try. I, I try to, to do what we can. God is just blessed in so many, so many ways. It's just, it's insane how God is, is working on a daily basis. So I love the fact that you write your own songs, a lot of them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know you're also employing a ghostwriter as well. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, we've actually, we, we've written um, the majority of the stuff that I, that I write, um, I record. But I also do a lot of writing for a lot of today's gospel artists. Um, we've had a lot of uh, indie country artists pick out um, some different songs. And I have the opportunity when I go, obviously, in Nashville uh, with the publishing deal that I'm on, I have a huge opportunity to work with so many different songwriters in Nashville, um, from established songwriters to up and coming writers. And, and it's great because, you know, you get in that writing room, the vibe's just rolling. And sometimes you, you come up with, killer songs sometimes you just come up with songs that at the end of the session you're scratching your head saying where did this even come from you know type type events but um but I'm loving it I absolutely love what I do and, and get to to express how I'm feeling and, and encouragement through the music that we write and sing um in, in every performance so I omitted earlier you've had 10 number one Christian country songs out there yes sir Yes, sir. <laughs> I know it's it, it makes you want to pinch yourself. Um, I can remember back in 2016, I got my very first number one song. I had been full time for about a year. And there was a song that I wrote sitting around a campfire one night uh, with a buddy of mine called Blue Jeans and Biscuits. And uh, we the I sent it out, did the music, sent it out and radio picked it up. They loved it. And I'll never forget when I got the phone call that it was a number one song. It also won Song of the Year at the Diamond Awards that year, and uh, and even Video of the Year won for uh, it won for Video of the Year for our music video, and it was crazy because it was just like at that moment, I'd felt like I'd accomplished something, and then we look back today, just landed our tenth number one song with a song called God Can, um, just a few months back, and which also won Song of the Year uh, as well this year, and it, it's amazing, you know, and it, it's so weird because I go back. Uh, to the songs I wrote like in 2015, 2016. And I'm like, oh, this is horrible, you know, <laughs> compared to today and seeing how we've grown. And um, my, my publisher got a hold of some old songs from a catalog and she was like, oh, I thank God we know you now instead of back then. And I was like, oh, thanks guys. Thanks. I guess that's a good sign. Um, but it's, it's just funny how God has worked through and, and just allowed us to, to hit radio with songs that 
means something, you know, where people can relate to it and, and actually feel, you know, and, and that's the thing when I'm writing, I don't want to just write a song. There, don't get me wrong. There's some great songs out there where you just clap your hands, have a good time. You know, it feels good. But then there's songs that I like writing that actually have a meaning to it and inspire you and encourage you to be the best version of yourself. I had a sixth grade teacher tell me this one time, and I've lived by this verse. And it says this, it is a sin to do less than your best. And so that's my goal is in every song I write, no matter if it's for me or for somebody else, every time I step on a stage, whether it's at a theater with 5,000 people or a local church with 75 people, whatever the case may be, when I step up there, I've got a job to do and that's be the best version of myself. And it's a sin to do less than your best. And so I want to give my best in every single solitary situation that I can do to help others. Cause you just never know who's going to be in that crowd. That's going through the exact same thing you are that needs that encouragement. That's got the fakest smile they've ever put on their face sitting there when really deep down inside they're hurting. And so it's my job to let them know, Hey, even on the worst day of your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, which all makes up our story, God's still God, and he's still in control, and uh, so that's what I try to do, just be the best I can be every single day, both on and off the stage. I love that so much because we can, again, lose that intentionality, and if we're not focused on performing at our best or doing our best in the daily actions that we have, doing our best in the moment, so challenges show up, and if you're not focused on love, if you're not focused on uh, elevating people in your life, elevating yourself and allow kind of that reactive behavior, right? And you're not taking control of your thoughts. Things can really, really go the wrong direction and you can miss opportunities and things. The way you were talking, it reminded me of when I was a kid, I forgot which baseball player it was, but I've heard it from a thousand baseball players since was, man, when I'm out on the field, whether it's a superstar player or a, you know, guy that gets 10 at bats a season, kind of a guy. Right. I love it. When I hear them say, I don't know who's going to be in the stands that day. I don't know who's going to be watching that day. Maybe a five-year-old kid. And for some reason he's got his eyes on me. Right. I never want to see, I never want to influence that kid where he sees a lazy behavior, where he sees me not working right. my best. It's a 162 game season. It's tough to be focused on every pitch. However, right. that might be the, the time they're looking at me. Right. And I want those right. kids and I want to give them the, I want to give them all their money's worth. Right. Exactly. And, and the I adults with- too, the adults yeah. too, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at people to see who's striving to do their best and who's, who's being lazy. Um, right. but, uh, oddly enough, a buddy of mine, he got to take the last at bat that Mark McGuire would ever have in his career. Oh, really? So Mark McGuire's in the dugout and, uh, uh, the coach, Tony LaRusso, decides we're going to pinch hit for him. Mark was hurt. He wasn't performing well at the end of his very last season. Right. And I, we needed a base hit. We didn't need a home run on this particular one. And odds of him getting a home run were pretty slim based on his physical condition at the time. So he decides he's going to pinch hit. And he calls Bobby Bonilla. He's like, hey, uh, go get Bobby. Tell Bobby to come up and hit. And right. so my buddy goes down to get him. And Bobby's towards the end of his career at this point, too. And he's like, Hey, Bobby, Tony wants you to pinch hit. He goes, nah, I'm good. <laughs> and my buddy Carrie's like, what do you mean? He's like, no, Tony wants you to hit. He goes, nah, I'm good. He goes, Hey, what, what are you doing back? And he goes, Bobby said he's good. He says, all right, then I guess you're up. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's awesome that's awesome <laughs> so my my buddy's name's carrie robinson and he took the last at bat mark mcguire was supposed to take and wow. uh it was because bobby's oh and bobby goes, i'm good i don't need that rook i don't need that <laughs> that's hilarious i love it i, I love don't know it. exactly what that means but right. if he'd have got up there to take that at bat i don't think he'd have been trying all that hard no. where the right. young hungry guy that's newer into the league he was hungry he wanted right. that at bat he didn't want to take it over Bobby Benia or Mark McGuire, but if somebody needed to step up, he was ready. He was going right. to do it. So exactly. um, anyway, pre- pretty funny to <clears throat> hear behind the scenes stuff in baseball and how this stuff actually happens. Right. 
<laughs> That's funny. So, so let's jump in. Let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, you got married at a younger age. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got married actually in 2014. Um, Love of your life, right? Oh, yes, yes. Um, and unfortunately, you know, because that's how we all get married. We all get right, married. Right, exactly. Like, exactly. Stay married forever and love of our life and being Christians. And well, actually, you may, you might not have been a, like out and out Christian at that point in time. I, I may be getting that part of the story. Yeah, wrong. No, no, I, I was. Um, but I'll be honest with you. In 2014, um, I had been dating this girl for about three years. And uh, we, we had talked about getting married. And every time we went on a date, when are you going to marry me? When are you going to marry me? And, and that's kind of kind of where we were at. And so we got married in February of 2014. Very, very small wedding, um, like 15 people, like seriously, just our family, our close knit family that was there. And we were married until August of 2018. And um, she left me in 2018. And it was one of those things to where I had a choice to make. I was given an ultimatum for lack of better words. And um, it was either her or continuing my singing career and, and, and serving God, which I felt called to do. And uh, during that time, things got very rough. Um, it, it just, I say, I say this a lot. I say that our stories are made up of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And many times the bad and the ugly is God's favorite time to move. And I had to learn that because I was hurt. I went through a major, major bout with depression. Um, I was told multiple or multiple occasions that the best thing for me to do was just to die. And when that happens from someone that you feel like that you absolutely love with all your heart, it, it just, it comes back and it really hits you in places that you just don't understand, you know, and you sit back and there were nights where, I would be here at the house by myself and I would just lay down and I would just be like, all right, God, just push the rapture button. Get me out of here. I'm done. You know, I, I don't want to sing anymore. Um, there was opportunities to where I, I just, I started canceling dates and I, I was telling my agency, I said, just don't book me. I don't want to sing. You know, I just didn't have that passion anymore. Um, and it was really crazy because we had a situation to where at this time I had two kids uh, one that was just born um, and one that was three years old. And um, they uh, they wound up at, uh, at, at during the whole, the whole process, I should say, um, they were withheld from me for 126 days. And it killed me because on day 127, um, after I was able to get in front of a judge to where the judge was forced them to let me see my children um, because they were just kind of holding them out of spite, if you will. Very first thing that my kid said to me when she got out of the vehicle, her eyes got real big. And this is what really got me. She turned around and she's like, daddy's not dead. Mm. And I knew right then that there was a major issue. Well, obviously fast forwarding, I, I did everything I could to try to be the best Christian that I could be. And um, obviously I told God, I said, God, I said, do I keep trying? Do, do I keep trying to restore this marriage or or what's happening. And finally, um, after some various events, I woke up one morning and I just felt peace to just wash my hands of the situation. And once that happened, things started happening to where things were getting better, you know, and no matter what was the lies that was said, no matter what was thrown at me or whatever the case, instead of me getting aggravated and just depressed, I just was able to smile and say, it's all right one of these days, the truth is going to shine. And, and it is, you know, when it started through there, um, on Christmas Eve, actually of 2019, the Christmas after all this happened, um, once again, uh, my kids were, were told, um, that I was leaving forever and I would never see them again and, and things like that. And I got so aggravated and so stressed out. This was prior to them being withheld for 126 days that I actually wound up having a heart attack at the age of 31 oh years old. Um, I stood 31 here. Yeah. 31 years old 31. And, and I'm in good health. You know, I mean, I'm not the most healthiest guy in the world um, compared to like a baseball player, but you know, I mean, I'm in good health. And uh, I got up, stood up out of a chair and hit the floor and both my mom and dad are in the medical field and uh, they worked with me, could not get me responsive. And so they called EMS and the paramedic that was working that night was a real good friend of my dad's. 
and he turned around and uh, my mom said this guy he was seven foot three he was huge huge guy goodness um but he turned around looked at my mom pillows a sheet and he said we got to go he said he's having a heart attack but it was in the back of the heart known as the widow maker yeah and uh, he told my mom and dad he said we got 20 minutes that's all we got and so they got me obviously in ems started getting me to the hospital as quick as possible and um halfway there i woke up like i just i randomly woke up and the seven foot three guy overlooking me i mean obviously i'm a redneck boy you know i mean i'll, I'll stand up do what i need to to protect myself and my family but this point when you're laying on a on a stretcher and you see a seven foot three guy over top of you you just lay there and smile and say how you doing you know <laughs> that's all you do but we we got to the hospital and uh, the heart attack had stopped right before it actually had started doing damage and um come to find out my body had stopped making blood and they couldn't figure out why they didn't didn't have a clue as to kind of what was going on and so obviously they said stress was what was going on at that point. And uh, they actually even thought I had leukemia. I had to go through the bone marrow test to, for leukemia. Um, that came back negative, praise the Lord. But the doctor told me, she said, what we're going to do is we're going to send you um, to the chemo room for, the, or it was two weeks back to back on, on a Wednesday. And she said, we're going to go give you some iron, give you some blood, kind of shock your body, you know, do the whole chemo thing, but very small type deal. Uh, from what I'm understanding, again, I'm not a medical expert. That's just what they were telling me. And the first day I went in, um, I had everybody laughing, joking, because, you know, I, I like to joke. I like to to do, I do comedy, a lot of comedy in my shows as well. And I like to make people laugh. And uh, that's just something that I do. And had some people in there laughing because, you know, they were in a whole lot worse shape than what I was in, you know. And that night, got home, I was sick as a dog. I was just, I, I, I was just sick, you know, the next day I didn't want to get up anything. And, um, then the next Wednesday that I went, it, I just, it just didn't work. You know, I didn't want to be there. I knew what was coming. I wasn't in my jokey mood. Well, I was sitting there, uh, they were starting the procedure and the sweet, well, the sweet little lady was sitting across from me and uh, she looked up at me and she said, are you showing Klein? And I, I ain't gonna lie to you, that made me mad. I was madder than 40 blazes because I'm up here, when I go to do shows, I want you to see me when I'm strong. I yes. want you to see me as, not only as, as a ministry and an encourager, but an entertainer, you know, for lack of better words. I want, that's what I want you to see me. At. When I'm sitting in that treatment chair, you saw me weak. You know, you didn't see me as the guy that makes people laugh, the guy that's a songwriter. The guy that's had 10 number ones. You don't see me as that. You saw me as a weak individual that was struggling. And it, it, it killed me. Well, we began talking. And I just kind of looked at her and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm shell on it. She looked at me and began to tell me her story on how her and her husband had followed me ever since I was a little kid with the Gilbert family. And they remembered me. And they'd been to several concerts. And even the last few months had seen me in different, different er, er, er areas and things like that. And it was so crazy because she looked at me and she said, my husband died about three months ago. Oh. I said, really? She said, yeah. She said in a week to the day after they buried him, she found out she had the exact same cancer he did. And she looked at me and she said, Shellum, she said, there was a concert you did in a little town called Troutman, North Carolina, which is where I grew up. That was where I was born. And I do a homecoming there every year at one of the high school auditoriums. And we had a big Southern gospel group in that night. I had a band with me that was playing. And she reminded me of that. She said, we were laughing. Everything was going good. She said, and then you just grabbed a stool and sat down. And your guitar player played Amazing Grace. And you just sang Amazing Grace to the rhythm guitar. And she said, there was nine souls got saved that night. And I said, yes, ma'am, I remember that. She looked at me and man, this is where I guess you could say my healing took place. Because she looked at me and she said, Shellum, she said, I know this is not the time nor the place. She said, but do you think you could sing just one more verse of Amazing Grace for me? And man, I ain't going to lie to you. You know, I'm going through literal hell at this point <laughs> with everything going on. And I didn't want to. I didn't want to sing. 
I could have cared less to even talk to that woman. But I started singing Amazing Grace. And there was nine patients, including myself, in that chemo room that day, getting their treatments. All nine of us started singing. Tears started flowing. Doctors poking their heads in, trying to figure out what in the world's happening in the chemo room. <laughs> but it was at that moment that I realized that the bad and the ugly was happening, but God was moving and turning it back for good. That night I got home. I wasn't sick. I didn't feel bad. The next day uh, I had gotten up and started like moving around. Everything was great. I had actually just started dating my now wife. And she told me, she was like, oh my goodness. She said, you've got more energy now and you're driving us all crazy. You know, that's just how it was because I had this peace about me. And I walked in the very next day to the doctor's office. They took blood and uh, to check and see where my levels were. And she walked in and she smiled and she said, three for three. And I said, okay, wh what does that mean? She said, you're the third patient I've seen today. that was in that revival service on Wednesday. And I was like, oh, okay, you heard about that. And of course, you know, they blamed me for it. Go figure, right? But she looked at me and she said, Shalom, she said, you're also the third patient I get to smile at today and <laughs> say, God must have showed up because your numbers are perfect. And there's absolutely no way that any of this could have happened unless God showed up in the chemo room. You know, I walked out of there. I, I'll never forget it. I had, because... Obviously, COVID was starting. This was in 2020. COVID was starting. Nobody could go in. And uh, all of my family was out in that parking lot waiting on me. And when I walked out there and I handed on that piece of paper, we had church in the parking lot. And those people coming up started shouting with us all just out of the blue that we didn't even know. And, and you know, it was crazy how God moved in the absolute worst situation of your life when it seemed all hope was gone, when it seemed like your world had just crashed down on you, God's like, dude, I'm not done with you yet. And, and that's something I had to learn. And I'm not gonna lie to you. My, and you can ask my wife this. She'll tell you this. I'm stubborn. I'm very, very stubborn. I'm stubborn as a mule. But that was a moment that had to get me to where I realized that everything that I was going through God had a plan for. And I was able to start my healing process. And then just a few months ago, I had a situation in Eastern North Carolina to where all those nights that I sat down and I was questioning God, I said, God, why in the world are you making me go through this? You know, I go out and sing for you to people who, in all honesty, could care less if I show up or not. You know, a lot of the church services I do, that's their home church. Oh, Shalom Klein's coming. whoop de doo You know, I mean, it's not, it's not like somebody huge was coming in. But God showed me that, gave me that answer as well. And that's the reason why even today, as we continue to fight these battles and continue to have to struggle, you know, here, there, and yonder, for lack of better words, it's the reason why I have a reason to smile. That's the reason why I can go out and one of the biggest things I've heard over the last six months is, Shalom, you have this glow to you when you're singing that you've never had before. And I'm hearing this from all different people that see me in concert. And the only reason I can say is because, yeah, because I've realized what my real plan was. And that's to be able to share my story and be an encouragement to folks that are in desperate need of Jesus Christ. And, and that's my job. You know, I get to be a missionary in my own home. You know, that's, that's where I get to be. And, and I love it. I'm absolutely loving it. That is awesome. So take, take us back to uh, kind of that anger you felt in the hospital when she starts talking to you. Oh man, I was just, I was so mad. You know, it was so weird. Cause again, you're sitting here and you're like, this is not how people are supposed to see me. And it was, it was so weird because, you know, I sit back and I think of that story now and I'm like, I was an idiot. You know, I mean, I just, you, you think of that because it's like, I was so mad that this woman knew who I was, but yet, you know, when you look at the stream of things, you want people to know who you are, you know, because yeah. you want people to, to, to enjoy your music. But at that moment, it was like Satan had me in this fog, 
you know, where it's like, you're worthless. You, you can't handle it. You, you're, you're nothing. And now, the, and then it was like, I had this thought of this woman seeing you weak. Just think if she goes and tell all of her friends, poor little shell of, you know, I'm not that guy, you know, and that's, that's where I was at. And Satan will use things. I have found out real quickly that Satan will use things that hit home that really get you like your family, your kids, people that you love with all your heart. He'll use them to try to get you out of the way because if he can take one warrior out, how many people is he keeping from Jesus for just one warrior? And and it, it, he tried that. He tried Thank God he failed, but he tried that, you know, and God worked that for good. So selfish pride, if I'm hearing yes. the hospital story right, sounded exactly. like selfish pride. Selfish pride. Exactly right. And, and, you know, again, I'm, my wife would be like, praise God right now when she's listening to this, you know, she's like, he knows it. But um, it's, it's one of those to where I was so caught up in myself because I realized, I did not realize, I should say, that God can use the bad and the ugly just like he can the good. You know, I was at that point where I was like, well, only God can use good stuff. No, that's not the case. And I've had to realize, and I've come to realize, bad and ugly that makes up just as much as our story as the good, that is God's favorite time to move. And that, in every concert, every event that you see me at, no matter if it's a church or an auction house or a rodeo, wherever the case may be, when you hear that, that is the story I portray, is we all have the good, the bad, and the ugly that makes up our story. But God's favorite time to move is the bad and the ugly, because there's people going through things in that bad and the ugly that you went through. And at those times, they don't care about how many number one songs you had. They don't care about all the good things, where everything looks all in words of my grandmother, hunky-dory, you know, that's a, that's a North Carolina word. But it's the bad and the ugly that they see and like, okay, well, if your God can bring you through that, then he can do the same thing for me. And I've realized that. And I, I can tell you countless stories um, of where that's the case, you know, where I had to get vulnerable and I had to share the bad and the ugly things. You know, it's good when we sit back and say, oh, yeah, yeah, the, the songs we've written, who, who's, who's numbers in my cell phone right now, who's friends of mine on the mainstream circuit. Or, or how many number ones you've had, you know, that's the good stuff. We let's face it. Let's be honest. We like that pat on the back. We're like, thanks, man. Yeah, we did. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. But when you have to get vulnerable to the bad and the ugly parts that in all honesty, you want to hide under the rug. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where people can really learn and understand and be encouraged the most. So you mentioned the awards and the pats on the back. So guys can fall into that trap for sure. We've got our work. We've got our paycheck. We've got our pats on the back. Hopefully that come at work. Right. We might not get those pats on the back in other areas of life as often or ever. Right. And we can tend to pour into what feels good and feels good for the moment, feels good for the months, feels good for a few years. And at some point we can get caught in that trap. Patrick Morley, man in the mirror was on. And he was talking about that and being a Christian singer and getting pats on the back for growing the kingdom. Right. You ever consider falling into that trap of I'm doing all this for God, almost like a pastor of a church. Right. Yes. Yes. M many times, many times. And, and I'm not gonna lie to you. It's funny because we're on Christmas break right now. And, um, it's, it's funny how I tell people all the time. It's like, all right, do people miss me? You know, do they, do they, are they wanting me to do more Christmas stuff? You know, and, and then you sit back and you're like, well, some days you're like, look what I've done. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, I might ought to bring that down a little bit because it wasn't me. You know, God did that through me and I'm just a vessel, you know, I'm just the vessel that he's able to use. And, um, I guess that's just kind of where you're at because you find you've got folks obviously that follow you and I've got several fans that if I'm within an hour of their house, they're there every time. And, you know, and you kind of feel like you kind of feel like you're a pastor, if you will, of them to encourage them. And, and, and I try to take time. This is something that I, as an artist, love to do. When you come to a concert with me, 
I want you to come give me your story. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you. I, you know, and some guys, and there's nothing wrong with it. Some guys stay in the bus until right at time. And that's fine. Some guys, as soon as they get off stage, they go to the bus, they got somebody man in their merchandise table. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I take it a little deeper. I get dressed early. So that way when people are coming in, I'm back there at my table. So if somebody just wants to come up and chit chat, um, you know, and we've heard countless stories and I tell people all the time, if you have a conversation with me, there's a 90% chance you're going to wind up in a song somewhere. It's just going to happen, you know? <laughs> and so I tell people that, and I, I start that when people say, start saying something like, Sheldon, can I tell you something? I was like, yes, but just know. And, and it starts, you know, it, it kind of breaks that barrier, you know? And, and there was like, for example, there was a kid 17 years old um, about a month and a half ago that walked up and said, okay, I've seen you on YouTube. We follow you on Facebook. We've heard you. Um, they've got a huge radio station that I'm being played at. Um, and they're like, we listen to it every morning and we hear your music. And it was like, I just, I just want you to know, I, I want to be a singer as well. And I sit down with this 17 year old kid and the, this young man had, he had been adopted. He had gone through a horrible life before he was adopted. And he was like, I have a story to tell too. And when he looked at me and said, Shellam, it's because of you that I want to share my passion and my story. You know, that was a win. That meant more to me than any of the number one songs I've ever had, because I've been able to be a blessing to someone. I, that was the first time I'd ever met. And it was a completely different state. Um, never forget, it was down in Alabama. And it, it was great. You know, I had never met this kid before. But my music was a blessing to him. And then I got to do a face to face. And now it's funny because th this he will email me all the time. And, and when people email me stuff, I, I, I actually look at it, too. I make sure that I get the opportunity to take a look at them. And, and it's funny because I try to respond and, and he'll be like, I've got this really cool song idea. And then it sends me this information and I'll just send back and be like, dude, I'm proud of you. Because, you know, sometimes that's what and guys, I understand this. We as guys. We, we like the macho. We want to be the macho guys. But I had to come to the realization. I like it when somebody looks and said, man, I'm proud of you. You know, I love that. And sometimes you're like, whatever, man. Thanks. You, you know, we're guys. That's what we do. But when somebody looks at you and says that, I mean, I've got a buddy of mine. That's what he does all the time now is, is that's kind of our little thing. He'll, he'll call me up. He's like, man, I just want you to know I love you and I'm praying for you and I'm proud of you. And you don't understand how much that encourages me. And, and then it's like, I turn around and I'll write a song right afterwards. He's like, uh, royalty check, please. You know, so it's an inside yeah. joke. <laughs> but, uh, and he's, he's actually, um, he, he's a teacher right now. And so uh, I'll give him like lesson ideas and he'll use me as examples when he's teaching the kids. And it's funny, you know, how, how God works different angles and different opportunities. And uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what God's doing. Have you got any, you've had some, traumatic experiences being away from your kids for 126 days against your will obviously i can't imagine that if you have any bouts of um during that time or after that time where you just had like extreme anger or extreme desperation and um how'd you deal with it in all honesty yes many times um i would beg i would i would text i would beg uh, to speak to my kids. I would, I would beg to just see my kids. Um, I bargained with every option that I had. And the only response I would get is your kids don't love you. Your kids don't love, or they won't, don't want to be around you. Um, the worst text message that I ever got was your kids told me today, they wished you were, that they were glad you were dead. And, and it, it was, it, it was an option to where, Satan was using that situation to try to hurt me. And, and I'm not gonna lie to you. There were nights that I would lay down and I would cry. Um, there were days I was ready just to give everything up. There was days that I was at the point to where, honestly, I was ready to go home. Mm -hmm. And I had this depression to where I even thought, you know, is the world, would, would the world even miss me? Would they even miss me if I was gone? And I'm not gonna lie. I got up these churches. I put the fakest smile on my face. 
I faked it till I made it. And uh, I would go into Nashville and uh, all of my buddies that was there, the songwriting friends that I would write with, every one of them would make the statement, dude, you're not yourself. You're not the guy that usually writes. And, and it cost me a publishing deal, actually. Um, it cost me a lot of networking opportunities because the fact I was like, yeah, it's a job, mm, whatever. And I didn't have any passion. No because passion. I was, life, yeah. I was depressed. You know, my kids are my world. And, and now I've got two biological kids. I've got a six year old and a four year old, both little girls. And I got married back in September and uh, my wife brought me a bonus kid along, which was a girl as well. So now I have a six, <laughs> a five and a four year old, all girls. Uh, Perfect. But yeah, it's perfect. Except for there's and three of them. Like, so now they're yes, fighting over exactly. playing with. Yeah, yeah, I get exactly. that. Exactly. And it's one of those things to where I have to make sure they fall asleep before I do, because if not, they'll wind up painting my toenails and my fingernails. And I woke up one time and had makeup all over my face and I looked like Bozo the Clown, actually. And it was it was hilarious. But but, you know, my kids are my world. All three of them. They're my world. And we've written several songs, <laughs> songs about them. Um, we've got a new album coming out in March and uh, it's actually got a song on it called Pineapples and Flamingos. Um, that is for my youngest, my four-year-old. And it was the song that she told me that she, I had to write for her. She gave me the title, told me everything she wanted in it. But my kids are my world. And if I had to do it all over again, to show my kids how much I loved them, I'd do it. But it took a lot of depression. I mean, there was a lot of anxiety and just a lot of things physically that affected me because you know I, I felt worthless I felt hopeless and I felt like I couldn't move it was just I would sit there at night I would have a picture frame of my kids and obviously this was be, before I got married and, and before I got my bonus kid but I would have a picture of Ella and Lena which is their names and I would just cry myself to sleep at night in all honesty, holding that picture frame. And uh, everywhere I'd turned, I'd had a picture of them somewhere. I had one in my car. Um, when I when I go, when I went to sing, and e even now, when I go to sing, I will put, there will be a picture of all three of my kids together somewhere on that stage. Because now, as I travel and sing, I, I, and I actually had a radio DJ ask me this a few months back, he said, what makes you want to travel hundreds of miles to go sing for people, not knowing how many people is going to be there? Obviously, after COVID, you know, everything's up in the air altogether. Yeah. And he said, with that, he said, what makes you want to go? And my answer was simple. I've got three kids. God's restored and brought those kids back to me, you know, and the 126 days, as much as I hated it, I learned so much through it. Because I realize now more than ever that my kids are my world. And that during the entire episode, as I call it, of life that I've, that I've been living, now I have a reason to be the very best version of myself because I've got three little girls that are watching me. I've got three little girls that love to sit and watch daddy sing. And I want to let them know that when they get older, they can be who they want to be. They can achieve their dreams. And that's my goal now is to not only share encouragement with the folks that listen, but give encouragement, inspiration to my kids to be what God's called them to be. It was so funny the other day, my little three-year-old, we were singing, going down the road. Uh, she was, she was with me and um, the other two munchkins were in school and Lena at three years old, she'll be four actually next week, or just uh, okay, on the 28th okay. of December. And uh, she, she looked up at me and she said, daddy. And I said, yes, baby. She said, I love you. And I said, I love you too, baby. You know, that kills me. I was just like, oh, yeah. you know. and she looked at me. She said, daddy, I want to be a superstar just like you. <laughs> and I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, honey, I'm not a superstar, but you be the superstar and you can be my retirement plan. You know, that's kind of what I'm hoping here, but but, you know, when it's all said and done, those kids are looking up to me. And just like we were talking, you know, there's people in the stands looking up at these baseball players like you were talking about earlier. Oh, my goodness. And people I... in those churches 
there's people in these theaters, my three little munchkins, they're looking up to me. And I've got to be the best example I can be through the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because they're going to face bad and ugly in their life. They are. And there's going to be days where they're, they want to give up. But if I give up, all they're going to know is to give up. And I can't. i got to keep pressing on. Because to me, giving up is not an option. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the kids absolutely are watching us. Absolutely going to learn from our actions. Our words are important as well, but our actions, they're always watching. They're always, always following. We use words and we talk about doing the hard work, being consistent, showing up every day, doing our best and um, outworking other people and, and things like that. That's just a constant, constant theme we're always talking about. And right. if it's an endurance race, I know my kids are going to win. Right. <laughs> I know they're going to win. I coach some of their teams and I'll run way over there and run, run back. Right. They might not win the way over there, but they're going to win on the way back or they're going to be in the second or third place. They're not going to be at the, the tail end of things because right. they, they know to dig deep. Exactly. So, and that's how it should be. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a story about maybe a, you're playing out somewhere and somebody was caught you after a show, another guy. Yes, sir. I was in eastern part of North Carolina and um, finished up concert. It was a Sunday morning. Everybody was gone except for me, the pastor, and the pastor's wife. It's a Sunday morning, uh, just actually about just about five or six months ago. And this little lady came in with te tears in her eyes. She was at the service and she said, you, would you take just a moment to talk to my son? And he was on the phone and I picked up the phone. I was talking to him and he had gone through the exact same thing. His wife had walked out on him. He had not seen his kids in about a hundred days. Um, wow. And he was at the point to where he was, he was just done. You know, his life was over. And I had to sing that night, but something just told me, you need to go see this guy. And I asked him where he was at. And he was about a mile from the church. And I told him I would meet him. He said, no, I'll just drive to you and I'll meet you in the parking lot. Well, I hung the phone up with him and started walking out. And I told the pastor and the pastor's wife and that mom, I said, just sit here and pray. That's all I'm asking. Just pray. And I walked out. He was in a Ford truck. I'll never forget it. And I uh, walked out to him and I got about maybe 15 feet from him. And he reached over in the front seat of his vehicle and pulled out a gun and put it to his head. I put my hands up in the air because obviously I'd never have to face a situation like this before. And he rolled his window down. The gun was still there. So I was watching the whole thing. And I knew that one mistake would cost this man his life. And it was at that point, he didn't care how many number ones I'd had. He didn't care about any of that. He didn't care any about the good that was going on. And I started telling him my story because I just pointed like asked him, I said, man, I said, how are you feeling? And he looked at me and he, he was like, I'm angry. I'm depressed. And he said, but you probably wouldn't know anything about that, would you? And that gave me an open door to be able to share <laughs> my story. And I literally sit, sit there for 45 minutes and I dug deep. I mean, I, I dug deeper than I'd ever dug before because not a lot of people had known what I had gone through. They knew I was facing that divorce. They knew, or they knew I had faced that divorce. They knew I had faced not seeing my kids for some time, but they didn't know the hurt. They didn't know the things that were said to me and about me. They didn't know the lies that I had to try to debunk, if you will. And they didn't know how I felt and how I faked it. And, and I told that guy that. And 45 minutes later, he had tears in his eyes and that gun was still at his head. And he looked up oh. at me. Never forget. Never forget what he said. He looked me right in the eye and he said, Shellum, you just told me the most horrible things ever. He said, but the question is, why did your God make you go through it if you were working for him? If your God loves you, this was his exact words, if your God loves you, why did you have to face all that? And the only answer that I could say was I looked him in the eye and I said, for you, and he said, for me, he said, 
you don't even know me. How did you go through that for, for me? And I said, because I was where you were at. And I said, I had to walk through it so hey, I could show you what the backside of all this looks like when it's all said and done. And I said, I'm here to let you know there's hope. And I'm here to encourage you that, yeah, life is hard right now and it's not fun. And it's the worst thing you've ever faced in your life. I said, but I'm on this side of it now and I made it through and you can too. I said, so yeah, I had to face all that so that I could have a story for you. And at that very moment, that young man took the gun down from his hand, handed it out the window to me. I took that gun. I grabbed him. I yanked him out of that truck. And right there in the middle of a parking lot, 50 feet from the front of the church. And this was after God's office hours. You know, this was after Sunday morning service. <laughs> like, you know, because some people think God only works from 11 to 12 on Sunday and that's it. No. I had the opportunity to lead that young man who literally was four days younger than me. Wow. Four days. I had the opportunity to lead, uh, to lead that young man to the Lord in the middle of a parking lot at a church in Eastern North Carolina after church was already over. And the only people that was left there was me, the pastor, the preacher's wife, that young man and that young man's mama. Wow. And that goes to show again, I mean, just even more evidence to provide the bad and the ugly is God's favorite time to move. If I didn't have a bad and ugly story, of the exact same thing that that young man was going through, where would that, that young man be today? Would he be living? You know, God allowed me to go through something that I didn't want to face. You know, we, we, we as guys, we want to be strong. We want to be courageous, but we can't face, we don't want to face the bad and the ugly, but I had to face that bad and the ugly so that that young man could have hope, so that that young man would know that there was somebody out there that went through the exact same story. I'm talking, I'm talking parallel to his story. And he was at the point to where five seconds later, he would have been in eternity. And it was, it was so crazy because that young man now is traveling around Eastern North Carolina sharing his story at different places for other guys as well. Mm. And that helped me with him because now that grew my ministry because I was the, I had the opportunity to share that, you know, his ministry is now because of how God used me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was like, we're expanding. And, and that's what I like to see because a lot of people think, well, it's just over and it's done. No, each and every one of us has a ministry whether we're in full-time ministry or not. And if we can share our story with someone else and they lead somebody else to the Lord, when we get to heaven, we're going to have a part in that. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? That's going to be, it's going to be us. And they're, and I, I look for it. I tell this all the time. I was like, I can't wait when we get to heaven and we're at the marriage supper of the lamb. I, I, and I like to think of it as a big old buffet of chicken. All right, let's just call it like it is. And you sit in there and you grab your, a big old chicken leg, and you know there's no calories in heaven, so you don't have to worry about any of that mess either. So you, you take a bite out of it. You got grease running down your face, you know, and all of a sudden somebody comes up to you, taps you on the shoulder. And you turn around, you look them in the eye, and they look at you and say, you don't know me. But it's because of you and your story and your willingness to share your story that I'm home. That right there is going to be worth every single solitary second of it. And I'm excited, you know, and I know some people may think, man, this kid's crazy. You're right. I am. But I have a passion now to where I know there's people out there going through the exact same thing. And several of us, and I'll put myself right in the front of it. Several of us have had to fake it till we make it. We've had to put that fake smile on. But at the end of the day, my God turned a sea into a highway for the Israelites back in the Bible. He can do the same thing for you and me. We just got to share our story so that we can lead others to the cross through the bad 
and the ugly that we've had to face in our life. Mm. Wow. What a fantastic story. So guys, I got a question for you. If you ran into somebody that was depressed, if you ran into somebody that needed to share a story, if you ran into somebody that needed something, would you help them? So Shellen, would you help them? Oh yeah. Would. Of course you would. Of course you would. So guys, hundred percent of us, I think are shaking our heads. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in. Who can I help? Not only do, are they not here right now, but point, point me at them. I'll go help. <laughs> right. Them. So let me flip that back to you. If you're that person that needs help, what you didn't hear Shellum say was I was depressed. I was feeling like I should leave this world. I didn't hear him one time say, and I thought about who I could reach out to. I thought about who I could share with. The time he was in the hospital, the nurse came over and starts messing with him. And he's like, leave me alone. I'm broken mentally, spiritually, physically. I'm just ugh, in a horrible space. I'm not in a spot of strength. I'm not, not my, my super powerful self thinking to himself, go away, woman. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> and instead, God, God uses her to take him out of that space. So guys, if you're in that spot where you're feeling the weight of the world's on you, if you're feeling like maybe it's time to check out, absolutely, if you start putting a plan together to check out, as soon as you start thinking about what type of gun or what type of pill or where you can get something, what day, what time, that's a absolute red flag. You've gone way too far, brother, and you got to go, you got to go make a phone call. You got to go hit your dad up. You got to go hit your friend up. You got to go hit some random person that you have no idea who they are and say, I need help. I need help. Uh, don't be so proud that you stay in that space. Uh, take action, do something. We had a, uh, the grief guru on a little while back and she's like, you don't have to stay there. It's your choice. You can take positive directions and move out of that. So I hear in Shellum's story, I'm like, oh my gosh, guys, like we all want to help that guy. And as, if we are that guy, we're so afraid to share, be vulnerable and ask for help. So I pray guys, if you get to that spot, ask for help, ask for help. Yes. Yeah, mm. Thank you, Shellum, man. Thanks for not only sharing your story, but having so many great ones to share with the audience of you connecting with others and helping them through stuff. So we always like to close out and ask if you've got anything additional you want to share with the guys. And I didn't prep you for this one. I don't usually prep guys, but right. if, you, if there's a challenge for you to throw out and one additional, you've got some music coming out uh, in March or so. So I, so take, take her away and hit up. Awesome. And if you forget one of those, I'll remind you. All right. Well, for sure. My challenge to all the guys listening today is this. God has a special plan for each and every one of us. Okay. And we, we, we try to lead our families. We try to do what's best in our life for our kids and for others. But here's my challenge for you today. I want you to pick out somebody that you know, and I want you to be that stronghold for them. And I challenge you to reach out to random folks, or to folks in your community, and just say, you know what? I'm proud of you. I love you. I'm praying for you. And, and be that bond, if you will. Because whether we want to admit it or not, we guys, we need that. We need that. We need somebody to say, come on, man, let's, let's go play around a golf or let's go shoot, sh shoot some guns or something, you know, whatever the case may be come together and say, you know what, man, let's do this. We're Christians. We're brothers in Christ. Find somebody and encourage them because you never know what's really lying underneath the surface. And I guarantee you there's someone out there that's struggling and it'd be amazing if you were the one to help them through it all. And also I'm going to give you another challenge to please go and follow the Shellum Klein music page. Yes, on, yes. On Facebook and Instagram. There you go. And even if you don't like me, I tell people this all the time because um, my record label, I just signed a new record deal and they asked me, they said, Shellum, they said, when you go sing, do people like you or do they tolerate you? Because we never really had pushed the social media thing. And I was like, well, I think they like me. They said, well, Facebook and Instagram looks like they tolerate you. So guys, this is what I'm asking. <laughs> I need you to go follow the Shellum Klein music page. It's S-H-E-L-L-E-M as in Mary, 
Klein, C-L-I-N-E music on both Instagram and Facebook. And you can share it with like 200 friends a day. All right. They'll let you do that. So please share, share, share. And even if you don't like me, please go follow it because it's the Christian thing to do. All right. It's just that simple. <laughs> the Christian thing to do. So just please go like it and share it with, share with uh, all of your friends or your neighbors. Let them know. And in all honesty, I watch that as well. Yeah, I've got a team that helps with social media now, but I like watching that. And if you're going through something or if you just want to share your story, remember, there's a 90% chance you'll wind up in a song somewhere. But if you just want to share your story with me, feel free to send it to me. Send, follow the page and then send me a message on Facebook. I'd love to hear what your story is. And if, it's, if I've been an encouragement and a blessing to you, let me know that. And let's work together for the kingdom because that's what God's called us to do. So go follow Shellum Klein Music and keep, an, keep up with our schedule, uh, ShellumKlein.com. We're also on YouTube as well, Spotify, everything. And uh, brand new music coming out with our tour for 2022 is called Real Life. So hopefully we'll be somewhere close to you and uh, come out and see us and let me know that you heard this podcast and we'll be able to kind of connect that way as well if I'm close to your area doing a concert. That's great. And I love the name of the title, Real Life. We just shared real life on this podcast. And I know coming up, you'll be sharing a bunch of stuff like that. And it's it's awesome. Got a lot of cool songs. They won't let me tell anything but pineapples and flamingos right now. But it's there, there's a lot of really cool songs that's going to be coming out. And all right, so I'll tell you this, but do not tell my manager. All right. They might yell. <laughs> okay. We actually have a song called Real Life that's a shout out to dads. All right. Okay. So, but y'all did not hear that. Don't tell anybody. Yet, all right? <laughs> Nobody knows. My manager's not here. The record label's not here. So we won't tell them. All right. Yeah, go. we won't tell them. We won't tell them. But can't, can't wait for that one to get out. And then, uh, then we'll share that with the audience and uh, in our, our Facebook group and that type of thing. That'll be great. That's cool that you wrote a song about dads. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For sure. Well, we appreciate it a bunch guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining the Facebook group and, uh, and sharing your thoughts out there. And, uh, you know, thanks for challenging others to be the best version of themselves and getting to know Christ better. Uh, I love, love that challenge of, I love you. I'm proud of you. And I'm praying for you. How encouraging is that to receive that? So guys definitely reach out to somebody that, that you love and care about and you're proud of and let them know that, uh, for sure your kids. And then grab somebody outside of your family. Uh, tell your wife that as well. Matter of fact, tell everybody you know. Tell everybody you know. Sprinkle that everywhere. That's right. That's right. For sure. And don't forget right. to go follow Shellum Climb Music Team. Yes, yes, yes. I just, I just had to throw that on, little plug in there. You know, where just it's... jumped on your Instagram also. So I just there you go. Exactly. Just followed as well. Go see his uh, his wife's engagement wedding ring picture and all that type thing. It's a, it's a nice rock you got her there. Oh yes, yes. She was very she was very happy about that one. It was awesome. <laughs> oh well, thank you so much for coming on. I uh, love this episode. Just love love the stories you've shared and uh, guys hope this is an encouragement for you whatever side of life you're on right now to ask for encouragement ask for help or to be an encourager to somebody else or both yes sir all Sounds right great. Yes, sir. god bless you Shalom. god bless you guys see you next have week have a good one